Hello, this is David Sloan Wilson for Evolution This View of Life, the magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. I am talking with the famed primatologist Franz Duval and a good friend. Hello, Franz. Hi, uh, happy to be here. And uh, we're uh, here to talk about this conference that you have helped to organize in uh, Italy, in Sicily, on the evolution of morality, the biology and philosophy of human conscience which will be held in June, 17 to 22. So, uh, Franz, what is this conference about? Well, this is an institute of the Italian government who has a very nice school set up uh, in Sicily where they organize many conferences and together with some Italians I have set up this conference with uh, a, a number like a dozen, more than a dozen excellent speakers on morality. Yeah. And, and morality is a sort of growing issue, I think, in, in both in neuroscience, in psychology, and, and of course in biology in general, because we're interested in how come that humans are moral beings, are other animals any, anywhere close to that, or is it very distant? And so that's sort of the question we want to address uh, in, in that meeting. And the meeting also has a bit of a religious component, because for many people, Religion and morality are sort of almost one thing, which I think is not entirely correct, but certainly uh, the two are related, and so we have that also in there. That's right. So that's awesome. And, and people can, uh, people can, uh, this can be attended? You, what, what, what kind of audience size do you anticipate? Yeah, so apart from the speakers, we have room for about 80, up to 100 maybe, uh, external visitors mostly students or postdocs are interested in the topic and, and for a reasonable price they, they, they get fat Italian food in Sicily which is not too bad I would say with a look on the ocean and then uh, in between they have discussions and, and uh, we have even an excursion so they get also to mingle with everybody so I think it's gonna be, I've done this before a very different meeting which was on the primate mind uh, yeah, so that was totally different, but it was at the same place, and, and I have a very good experience with that. Okay, so this is going to be a great aesthetic experience in addition to a great uh, yeah. intellectual experience. Yeah. Um, awesome. So some of the people that uh, are going to be here, I have we're going to be Philip Kitcher, uh, the great philosopher, Patricia Churchland, uh, Pierre Francisco Ferrari, I might garble some of the uh, some of the Italian names, Richard Joyce, who wrote a book on uh, the evolution of morality, yeah. Oren Harmon, his book on the price, the price of altruism. Um, uh, Christopher Bohm, who has been so influential in uh, egalitarianism. Uh, so Jeffrey Schloss, that's be an Aaron Oranzean. That'll be part. Yeah, of wait, the wait a second. So Christopher Bohm, I just got in the mail his new book. Yep, that's right. What is it? Uh, Moral Origins. Yep. It has an apple and a snake on it, which which <laughs> hints at the religious connection right away. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, for the for the uh, kind of the uninitiated audience, uh, uh, friends, our viewers who want to know like what evolution has to do with morality, could you just give us a few minutes? This is something that you've talked uh, thought about very deeply, um, and the uh, the animal roots of morality is something that you've spoken eloquently about in your many books. So, uh, but um, if you could just give a little taste about about. Uh, how a, a, a primatologist and an evolutionist such as you approaches morality, and what, well, maybe that's enough. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, Darwin wrote about it in The Descent of Man, and, and basically he said that he thought evolution could have produced morality, um, could have produced altruistic behavior and sympathetic tendencies that are all required for morality. Then he, he had this defender, Huxley, Thomas Henry Huxley, who basically pushed morality outside of evolutionary biology. He said it, it could not have been produced. It must be a cultural invention of the human species. And I think what we have had in the previous century, between about 1970 and the year 2000, is 30 years of people hammering away at saying that we were far too selfish and too competitive to have a natural kind of morality. So they were... They were following the Huxleyan line. So, for example, Dawkins was follow following the Huxleyan line. Yeah. The only exception was maybe um, Ed Wilson, who didn't follow, and you also didn't follow that line. So, but but, but you, you know, the majority of people, you know that yourself, yeah. the majority of people were hammering on this theme like, we are too selfish to be moral. Yeah. 
Then around the year 2000, things started to change for the humans, at least. So, so the economists and the psychologists, such as Jonathan Haidt, uh, these people started to say, well, actually, you know, humans are quite cooperative species, and morality is maybe part of that whole picture. And so they started to come back to the Darwinian position, sometimes excluding animals, but I think now more and more we're also including animals and saying, like Darwin said, uh, the, the animal social instincts, which we see so clearly in, in the primates and, and in dolphins and elephants and that kind of animals, the animal social instincts are probably the basis of moral tendencies. Now, that would not mean that you can reduce moral tendencies to a few emotions or uh, a few social relationships as we see them in the animals, uh, but, it, but it builds that bridge, that connection. And, and so that's one of the goals that we're going to explore at the meeting. But the meeting also has many philosophers, as you've noticed, like... Uh, yeah. Kitcher, Churchland, um, who else? Um, Jeffrey Schloss, Flanagan. Yeah. Uh, Although these are, these are these are philosophers that are very well informed biologically. Yeah. So and, and they are all going to stress other things, like the, for example, the is ought divide. You know, that's a very complex issue. Is can we move from how humans behave and animals behave? to how we ought to behave according to a moral system, which is for philosophers the most vexing problem of all, and so we're going to be hammering that out, I suppose. Well, there's two things, I think, maybe to finish up. Uh, this has been a great talk. I, certainly, what's my appetite? I wish I could be there. Um, and uh, so we've already made a connection between uh, morality and altruism, but there's a couple of other connections, because as you know, morality is a multidimensional concept. And another connection is social control. Yeah. And uh, what Chris Bohm's work is so uh, important for is for is for the thesis that what made humans different than the typical primate model was uh, not altruism so much as as the kind of social control that results in egalitarianism. Yeah. And so uh, and that's also the theme of Richard Joyce's book, I think. Uh, so could you just speak a little bit on the issue of social social control? And then I got one last one for you. Yeah, so Chris Baum in his new book, um, well, he, he has had that idea, I think, for 15 years at least, is the idea that humans self-select. Like, uh, if I live in a small community and someone rapes my wife or rapes anybody for that matter, um, that's not a pleasant companion to have in the community. And so we will get rid of that person. We either execute them or expel them and, and let them fend on, the, on for themselves. And that is almost certainly certain death because people cannot really survive very well outside of a community. And so uh, Chris Baum is arguing that we have been maybe for a couple of million years, we've been selecting within our communities people that we don't want. And that's a sort of self natural it's what, what Darwin would call artificial selection, basically. We're sort of breeding humans according to the way we want them. And I'm not sure that that kind of control is that common in, in chimpanzee or other primate groups. I think the punishment side of morality is much more developed in humans than in these other species. who have They have the pro-social side, so to speak, and they have reciprocity and all of that. But they are not systematic punishers, I think. Right, right. <laughs> And then the other one is uh, actually in the title of the uh, of the um, conference, uh, conscience. So, where does what is conscience? Uh, where does that come into the picture? That's a very difficult issue. I always look at, but I'm very simplistic in that. I look at conscience as a sort of internalized set of rules. Is that you have encountered so many uh, negative responses to certain behavior? Then at some point you internalize them and you don't even need the negative responses anymore. You're sort of internally generating these negative responses. People have tested that on dogs. It's sort of interesting whether dogs in internalize rules. And so they've tested that by putting a dog next to a bowl of meat and then telling the dog you cannot touch it and warning them and then leaving the room. And then there's a video camera who films how long does the dog take to touch the meat. And there are breeds who immediately start eating. You, you're barely out of the room and they immediately, like the, the Basenjis, I believe, they start, immediately start eating. <laughs> and there's other breeds, like the Border Collie, who will sit there next to the bowl and look, look the other way, not look at the meat, and ignore it. And, and so the, that dog has an internalized obedience system, which I think is getting close to human uh, conscience, maybe. 
And again, uh, uh, we're familiar with this, but uh, for uh, the uninitiated viewer, uh, why have dogs become so important in this story? Yeah, dogs, first of all, of course, are because they're easy to work with. That's one reason for sure. <laughs> Uh, but also, dogs are bred by humans, and, and so we have sort of shaped them in our image, almost. Right. They have a lot of the pro-social cooperative qualities that the wolf had, but we have added some to it uh, that pleased us a lot, and so, uh, so we, we like dogs for that reason, I think. So dogs could have a more human-like intelligence than chimps in some respect, because they've been genetically evolving in the context of human society for, what, about 70,000 years? What's the, yeah. what's the, what's but, the but I'm a bit skeptical about their high intelligence. They, you know that the dog has 33% less brain size than a wolf? Uh -huh. And so all these comparisons with wolves, they're sort of falling apart now because what people are doing in some of the studies is raising wolves in a human home. And all of a sudden the wolves can do a lot of interesting things also. So, so part of these studies were confounded by the fact that the wolves were not so used to humans and then tested by humans, and we're not doing too well. Okay. Well, this is just, uh, this is such fascinating research, and for me, it's uh, such a sign of what's, uh, what's happening, what our magazine is all about, and what's happening in our field. And uh, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, I think it would be kind of shocking for a, a conference on morality to be as interdisciplinary as this one is going to be. Yeah, that's good, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Franz. And, uh, Thanks, and we, David. We will have a reporter at the conference covering it. So, uh, and very happy to uh, bring it to the attention of the public right now. Okay. Excellent. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye.